Today I want you to ask yourself this question. When was the last time that you saw a horror film directed by a women filmmaker? No! God, please, no! Welcome to our third week of Halloween. In the last few years there have been a lot of incredible well-directed films that have reached cult status and they were directed by women filmmakers and women filmmakers all together they've been climbing the steps of horror cinema with a lot of different refreshing takes and a lot of new ideas and stories to tell and it's incredible if you think just about uh, this year's Palme d'Or winner, of course, Julia Ducournau's Titan. And then if you think about Jennifer Kent with her cult classic The Babadook and her next film, The Nightingale. Or even if you think about A Girl Who Walks Home Alone at Night, which was an incredibly weird black and white vampire Muslim story. And it was directed by Anna Lady Arampour. <laughs> So for this 2021 Halloween season, I actually wanted to give a shout out to a couple more women filmmakers. I didn't want to specifically choose films that you might have heard of, so it's going to be a lot of indie films that have been released on streaming. But I wanted this Halloween season to be about representation, to be about discovering new things. Like snorting Scooby Snacks was a good idea, Scoob. <laughs> <laughs> the first film that I'm going to be talking about is called Satanic Panic. It's directed by Chelsea Stardust and it came out in 2019. Stardust has worked a lot with Blumhouse production and she's worked on a lot of franchises that you probably know like the Paranormal Activity franchise, Purge franchise, but also other films like Lords of Salem. Satanic Panic is of course inspired by the exploitation horror films that came out in the 70s and the 80s. It is a Fangoria production so you can imagine that there must be a lot of love when it comes to how this film was made. And the director was inspired by films such as House of the Dead Devil, Race with the Devil, or even the film Deathgasm. And she even said that there is a little bit of Jennifer's body in it, which I definitely agree with. And that's another film directed by a woman filmmaker that you should definitely give a look at if you still haven't. A pizza delivery girl at the end of her financial rope has to fight for her life and her tips. When her last order of the night turns out to be a high society satanist in need of a virgin sacrifice. I really really liked this film mostly because it was really embracing the campy side, it was incredibly gory, it was incredibly fun. It had a lot of interesting performances but it never took itself too seriously while also of course creating a film that exists within our patriarchal society and that of course deals with the kind of everyday sexism that you can see in real life. The thing that I really liked about this film and also Stardust's career is that she seems to be a huge fan of horror filmmaking and in fact in a very recent interview she said that she would love to keep exploring other subgenres She'd love to do a slasher movie and even something that is body horror. She'd even love to do something like that is more serial killer focused. And she wouldn't mind doing a man versus creature. She wouldn't mind doing man versus animal sort of movies. And basically, it's really obvious that she's a huge fan of the genre and that she wants to try anything. And I'm really looking forward to see what she will do in the future. I'm not in control. Don't want to know what's in there. I'm scared of her. I would swap her to have him back. The next film that I'm going to be recommending is going to be Prevenge. It came out in 2017 and it's Alice Lowe's directorial debut and she's starring in it as well. It's quite an incredible story because the primary photography was done in two weeks, which is insane, even for an independent movie. And she did it while being pregnant. And the baby that you can see actually at the end of the film was her own child because they shot the last few scenes 10 days after she gave birth. 
and apparently she channeled a lot of her insecurities and a lot of her fears about her career as a filmmaker and also as an actress into this film and that's why it turned out so well. The story goes as follow. The widow Ruth is seven months pregnant when believing herself to be guided by her unborn baby she embarks on a homicidal rampage dispatching anyone who stands in her way. And when I watched this film I was so incredibly amazed by the amount of empathy that went into the writing of this character and to her performance as well. I was just amazed by the fact that in almost a hundred years of filmmaking and of history of horror we haven't had a lot of interesting looks into women serial killers and especially when those kind of stories are also told by women filmmakers and this film was just such a breath of fresh air while also having that weird satiric and ironic kind of humor that we love from British cinema. I was wondering if I could talk to you about child charity. You're insane. I am a working mother. Female characters are always mothers or girlfriends who provide some sort of network for the hero who then goes out and does whatever he wants. But what about a woman who's cut off from society? Ruth's philosophy is that society is selfish and collectively her victims made a bad decision to destroy the love of her life. Her husband whose death we learn about via creepy flashbacks. And they ruined the future of her baby. You know I sort of see parenting sometimes in that way where people are having this sort of to me like quite psychotic conversation with their child. Do you want this? Do you want that? Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want that? Do you want that? And I'm like just leave them alone there's nothing wrong with a bit of silence you know and I kind of felt that there was this this psychosis around. In February 2021 Lois announced her next film which is going to be called The Time Stalker and it will star Low once again and the film will chronicle one woman's unrequited love across several centuries from 1680s Western Scotland to the apocalyptic 22nd century and she also stated that this film will be a homage to this kind of overly dramatic lavish passionate romantic epics. The next film I wanted to recommend is The Love Witch and it came out in 2016 and it's directed by Anna Biller. It was shot on 35 millimeters and it was made and colored to look like one of those weird pulp horror films from the 70s, the 60s and the 80s and just from a cinematography perspective it's an incredible looking film and this film you probably have heard about it mostly because it featured among the best films of the year 2016 in the list of The New Yorker and In The Wire as well. But just in case you haven't heard anything about this film, in the film The Love Witch, a modern day witch uses spells and magic to get men to fall in love with her with deadly consequences, of course. Biller considers herself as a feminist filmmaker and within her career she deeply wants to explore a different way of looking at shooting films through a female gaze. And she's pretty vocal on her websites and on her blog posts and her interviews when it comes to gender inequalities in the industry as well. Is there an anti-female thing here as well? Do you find, did you find that while you were making this? I didn't have that problem in pre-production. I have that problem a little bit with some of, the, some, of the, some of the press and some of the audience. And I don't think that's because I'm a woman as much as because the script was written by women and it was directed by women, it has a quality to it that is not necessarily what a man would do. And I started looking through a blog post and she writes incredible articles criticizing films from the 80s and especially horror films as well and exploitation films and any kind of films that used women as objects. I for example stumbled upon an interesting critique of the film I Spit on Your Grave which is a film that I actually talked about a couple of weeks ago and I will Put the link of the video up here just in case you missed out on it. Why does she stay in the stupid cabin? Is she a total idiot? Doesn't she know that they could come back at any time? Why would she stay there? Stupid decisions like this make her seem like a fake character. A real person would call the police, call the hospital, but she's not a real person. She's a mannequin in a porn fantasy. The Love Witch is actually her second long feature and the first feature was a sexual comedy that came out in 2007 and was called Viva. This is suburbia in 1972. Meet Barbie, your typical suburban housewife. Welcome Barbie Smith to the sexual revolution. I love the fact that she's a true 
artist, meaning that she works on everything when she's working on projects. She works as a director, as a producer, as a writer, as an editor, as a production designer, as a costume designer, as well as a composer. And I have an incredible amount of respect for the people who manage to do all of that without imploding. I have no idea how they manage to do it on their own, but it's incredible and I'm really looking forward to her third feature. The Love Witch uses the figure of the witch as a metaphor for women in general, as both an embodiment of men's fears of women and of women's own innate powers of intuition and as mothers and sorceresses. And B Biller is actually not interested in replicating the same mistakes that were made during the exploitation era of horror filmmaking of the 60s and the 70s. And she's actually doing the complete opposite of that. And in an interview, she actually said that that stuff is interesting in the history of censorship, but they're often just really bad movies, which I completely agree. If, for example, once again, you go back to the film, I spit on your grave. I'm in conversation with earlier movies and with my own fantasies about being a woman and overthrowing patriarchal oppressions that I face in my life. I can't get into the mind of a male producer in the 60s was making exploitation because those films were made for men's pleasure. They didn't include women as a viewer or spectator. Whereas a movie like Marnie does, I just don't really have a connection to exploitation because I see it as just a precursor to pornography. I mean conversation with the pornography that's all around us, which is a completely different thing, of course. When I was raped uh, like more than 30 years ago, if you were raped, you couldn't, uh, you, you would find yourself very much on your own. Hearing scarf, it's a shame, you should have died, you should be, you will never be the same again, you will never recover, da, 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 which is not really helpful. Deux jeunes femmes marginalisées par la société se lancent dans une tournée destructrice de sexe et de violence. Briser les normes et tuer des hommes, c'est aussi briser la complaisance du public de cinéma bien pensant. Ce que vous faites est terriblement violent. Vous avez dû tellement souffrir pour en arriver à ces extrémités. Je lis en vous comme dans un livre ouvert. Et il y a d'autres packs que je passerai volontiers avec vous. Du coup, maintenant on va parler de Baise-moi, qui est sorti dans les années 2000, et bien sûr c'est un film culte qui fait partie de l'histoire du cinéma d'horreur français. C'est réalisé par Virginie Despentes et Coralie Trinti. Et pour ce qui concerne Virginie Despentes, il y a tellement tellement de choses à dire sur elle, sur sa vie, sur toutes les choses qu'elle a accomplies en tant qu'écrivaine aussi et non seulement réalisatrice. Du coup, je pensais vous donner un petit aperçu de sa carrière et de tout ce qu'elle a fait parce que je pense que ça peut vraiment vous apporter une vision différente du film Baisse-moi qui en fait est un film qui est assez difficile à regarder parce que ça me rappelle un petit peu si vous avez vu le film Henri Portrait d'un tueur en série, imaginez ce film-là mélangé avec les techniques du, des films des années 90 du groupe Dogma 95 du coup, c'est des films qui ont l'air très amateurs. La cinématographie, ça a l'air d'avoir été tourné, par exemple, avec un petit camcorder des années, des années 2000, par exemple. Et en fait, ça a l'air très cheap, mais complètement fait exprès, parce qu'en fait, ça donne vraiment un une sensation de réalité et ça donne une sensation de brutalité au film que tu ne pourrais jamais avoir eu s'ils avaient essayé en fait de rendre ça beaucoup plus joli, beaucoup plus peaufiné en fait. Pour ce qui concerne Virginie Despentes, en 2006 elle a publié un article très important pour ce qui concerne la théorie de genre et du féminisme qui s'appelle King Kong Theory. Et elle avait écrit cet article justement parce qu'elle avait été très mal reçue lors de la publication de son livre Baise-moi qu'elle a ensuite adapté en tant que film. Rape, I'm 45 years old and I think I've been he he listening about women gathering about rape for more than 30 years now and I'm tired. I want to see men, really, I want to see men gathering and please uh, uh, try to understand what's going on with you. How can you be a rapist? How can you prevent it? Because we can't. Je suis devenue une prostituée, j'ai fait les rues avec des hauts décolletés, des chaussures à talons, sans devoir d'explication à personne. Et j'ai gardé et dépensé chaque centime que je gagnais. J'ai fait du stop, j'ai été violé, j'ai encore fait du stop. J'ai écrit un premier roman et l'ai publié sur mon propre prénom, clairement féminin, sans imaginer une seconde qu'à sa sortie, je serais continuellement sermonné sur toutes les frontières à ne jamais franchir. Je voulais vivre comme un homme, alors j'ai vécu comme un homme. The last movie that I'm going to be talking about today, so my last recommendation is Sea Fever and it came out in 2019. The crew of a West of Ireland trawler marooned at sea 
struggle for their lives against a growing parasite in the water supply. Sea fever is a weird mix between a National Geographic film, a science fiction film, and a horror film like The Bay that came out a couple of years ago. The thing that I really liked about it is that you're always surprised by where it's heading. It never actually becomes a creature film. It never becomes a fully gore horror film. At the end of the day, this is really a film about human beings who are putting their lives at risk because they have to, because this is their last chance to earn enough money to save their boat and, and to save their business. This is the thing that I really liked about this film and all of the films that I actually talked about today is that they tend to be very grounded in reality. Sea Fever was directed by Nisa Hardiman. This is her directorial debut. When it comes to her past, she has directed a couple of episodes of Marvel's Inhumans, Jessica Jones, and also a couple of episodes of the series Z, The Beginning of Everything. I would say that maybe the only issue about Sea Fever is that the boat is kind of too small, which kind of reduces the scope of the film and the different options that are available when it comes to the different shooting sequences they were able to do. And of course, if you want a horrible mention, I will advise you to give a chance Nia De Costa's Candyman, which came out just a couple of weeks ago. And even though I'm not a huge fan of the original, I find it interesting, but it's definitely not as iconic to me as other films from the 90s. I still really enjoyed it, mostly because of its cinematography, but also because of the weird kind of puppet shadowy games that they did to tell the story and the origins of this Candyman. Don't, don't say that. Candyman. I think it's definitely something worth watching for this Halloween season and of course it's gonna be a lot more interesting than to watch Halloween Kills which is just a rehash of things that we've seen over and over and over again across the years. I hope you had a great time watching this video let me know in the comments who are your favorite women filmmakers nowadays whether they are working in horror or in Hollywood in general or even within the art house and independent cinema market. And let me know in the comments because I'm really interested in discovering new things this year. Having said that, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe because it always helps. I'm Patrick and this is Torn Apart. Favorite food, sir? That's a very long answer, thank you. There. I hope I didn't disconnect my mic there.